Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. So what happens next after this life? It's the beginning of the new year. We're asking that question, what happens this year? But what happens after this life is done? Last week, we looked at what the scripture said about heaven and what Jesus taught us about what we can look forward to, the amazing joy, the amazing experience of being in the undiluted presence of God in heaven. So does everybody go to heaven is the question today. If you hang around funeral homes, you might think so because it's almost invariable at every funeral, there'll be people who'll say, well, at least he's not suffering anymore or at least she's in a better place now. Even if they had rejected God, had nothing to do with them, we'll usually hear that somewhere along the line. At least they're in a better place now. But are they? How do we know? What if they're not in a better place? Last week, uh, I made reference to near-death experiences. That's when somebody clinically dies, and they come back, having been resuscitated, reporting to have left their body and experienced perhaps an amazing light, uh, a presence, being of love, uh, a heaven-like experience. And uh, those are, are fun to listen to. Uh, they make you think as well. What doesn't get as much coverage, though, are near-death experiences that are not positive. Uh, Dr. Maurice Rawlings is a cardiologist uh, at the University of Tennessee, specializes in resuscitations. And he's been there when lots of people have been revived after having lost all of their vital signs. He's interviewed about 300 people. And what's different about his interviews, uh, he interviews people who had near-death experiences, but he interviews them immediately after they've been resuscitated. Not a week later, not a month later, a year later, but within minutes of them being resuscitated when they're too shaken up to kind of gloss over anything. And some report a wonderful place, an experience uh, of a being of love and light and what we really think of as heaven. Uh, but a significant percentage of those who come, and, and I've heard anywhere between 25 and 50 percent, uh, report the opposite, not a joyous experience, not light, but having experienced fire, tormented beings, tor creatures that torment, not heaven at all, but rather the opposite. And what's interesting is that Dr. Rowling says that if you ask those same people, say 48 hours later, what did you experience? Or a week later, they will not report the negative part of things. It's like they don't want to admit to themselves or to their families uh, that they experienced something like what the Bible would call hell. Uh, they got a glimpse of something other than heaven. And this is what Dr. Rollins concluded. He said, just listening to these patients has changed my life. There's a life after death, and if I don't know where I'm going, it is not safe to die. Now, reading the New Testament um, we, will ex we won't be surprised to hear somebody talk about a hell experience. Jesus taught the reality of hell. The apostles believed in the reality of hell. The Christian church throughout history has always taught and believed in the experience of, of hell. Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, Evangelicals all agree that rejecting Jesus can, line, uh, end up, uh, can land somebody in hell. Now, as a pastor, I can't avoid this topic as much as I would like to. Uh, there are those who will say, well, instead of, you know, trying to scare people about talking about hell, just talk about Jesus' love and uh, about how he wants us in his family. And believe me, I do that. And I'd rather not speak about hell, honestly. It's disturbing. Um, I enjoy talking about heaven. But here's the thing. Jesus is the one who told us about hell. And if I'm going to talk about and preach about what Jesus said, uh, 
I've got to talk about hell along the way. I mean, how can I justify not doing that? Am I more enlightened than Jesus? Like, yeah, he talked about hell, but now I know better. Or, you know, I'm more in touch with God's reality and eternity than Jesus. Or uh, I'm more loving than Jesus, so I won't talk about hell. No, obviously that's not the case. Jesus did teach about hell, not just in a passing comment, but pretty intentionally. Uh, for example, there's a story in Luke chapter 16. If you've got a Bible, I encourage you to turn there. Luke 16. There's a story there about an unnamed rich man and a beggar named Lazarus. Now, to be clear, this is not the same Lazarus Jesus had resuscitated uh, out of the grave. Now, this is a different one, uh, but it's a penetrating and uh, piercing story. We're going to hear it today. And I uh, asked uh, Ryan Kick, our youth pastor, to come and and to share reading of that story. So let's stand together in honor of God's word, and let's hear Luke 16. Luke 16, uh, verse 19 through 31. There was, a, uh, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate uh, was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, uh, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called out to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us uh, and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will also not come to this place of torment. Abram replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. So Father Abraham, or no Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses or to the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. You can be seated. So that's a pretty sobering story. Uh, Jesus is trying to make a very specific point about the reality of hell. And now we don't know everything about hell. We don't know, uh, have all of an uh, the answers to all of our questions about it. But we do see a few things in the scripture and, and from Jesus' teaching that are clear. One is that hell is a place of unending pain and punishment. It's hard to get around that. Because Jesus referred in graphic terms to this place called hell. He used strong, alarming language. It's, it's a terrifying place with suffering and fire and darkness and regret. And verse 24, I am in agony in this fire, says the rich man. Jesus is telling us that we remain conscious um, in hell. We're aware we're there. R rich man, uh, he, he knew he had five brothers. He cared about helping them avoid ending up where he did, which tells us that each person in hell knows that they're there. Uh, maybe physically they're dead, but they retain their desires and their memories. And Jesus says it's a place where people suffer in terrible ways. They long for relief, but they don't get it. They want to escape, but there is no hope. Uh, Matthew 13, 49 to 50 says, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sense of deep regret. Mark 9 it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. And then Jesus talks about punishment that's not ending. It says in Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the, e into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 46, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. These are not the verses that we memorize and put on our mirrors, right? This is sobering 
rather disturbing stuff. And then we might say, well, you know, maybe the fire thing, maybe that's not literal. All right, I don't know. If it's symbolic, here's what it's symbolizing. It's symbolizing pain and agony. It's not comforting any way you slice it. So Jesus is trying to be clear. Um, this is a place of pain and punishment. And also that hell is com the complete absence of God and his nature. Last week we said heaven is the undiluted presence of God where Jesus is present. The risen Christ is glory and glory is present. And hell is the exact opposite where God is not, where Jesus is not. Jesus says there's a great chasm that's been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. So God's presence is separated from hell. Now, all good gifts come from God, which means that where God is not, his gifts are not. I've heard from some folks say, I know I'm going to hell, but, you know, all my friends are going to be there anyway, so we're just going to party forever. That's what we're going to do in hell. And I think to myself, I sincerely hope you're not going to be in hell. I sincerely hope your friends are not going to be in hell. But if you end up there, you won't know that your friends are there. You will not party there. You will not have experience of friendship there. Because love, joy, and peace, these are fruit of the Holy Spirit. Where the Holy Spirit is not, neither are his fruit there. You will not party in hell, and you will be alone there. That's the, the teaching of the scripture, that we're not going to experience joy. Now, when you hear about this, and we could go on about what the scripture says, but I think we get the idea. You don't want to be in hell. Neither do I. It's a terrifying place to be for eternity. So the question is, how could a good God send people to that kind of place, to that kind of hell? And what we need to know is that God does not send anyone to hell. We choose where we want to go. After death, we get what we want in spades. If we want Jesus' presence in our life, if we want to know him, if we want to experience him and, and uh, his lordship, we get that fully in heaven. We get that more than we can comprehend right here. We get to experience the one that we would have, have trusted here, the one who we have longed to know. We get to know him fully in heaven. But if we don't want Jesus here, if we don't want him in our life, if we'd rather ignore him, then we get that in spades, and that's called hell, the absence of God. And when you think about it, it does actually kind of make sense. Think about the person, it, 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 see, if you don't want Jesus here, it won't be heaven for you to be with him forever. Uh, who is it, and just mentally, don't say it out loud, who is it that you, the, your least favorite person on this planet, the person that you really don't care for, you don't like? All right, what if I were to say to you, you get to be up close and personal in the same room for eternity with that person. Would that be like, yay? Would that be heaven for you? I don't think that would be heaven for you. If you don't want Jesus in your life here, it's not going to be heaven to be with him forever. When we are done with this life, God gives us what we want fully, like I say, in spades. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, then I hope that this will impact the way you live. Uh, because realizing that hell is real produces an urgency in anybody who really lets that sink into their heart. Um, so that rich man in Luke 16, he was suddenly very concerned for his brothers. He had an urgency about him. In verse 27, he answered, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. This rich man knew, okay, I can't go and warn them, but uh, the guy who's in heaven, maybe he can return and say, hey, you just want to come to be with me. You don't want to be that other place. 
but that was not an option. Um, so the rich man says, send somebody. If you're a follower of Jesus, you and I, we are the someones. We're the ones that get to interact with people here on this planet and tell them, you really want Jesus. You don't want to be absent from Jesus your whole life um, and through eternity. April 10, uh, 1912, a Scottish preacher named John Harper boarded the Titanic. He had a six-year-old daughter with him and his wife's niece with him. He was going to Chicago where he was going to preach at uh, a church that was started by the famous evangelist D.L. Moody. And uh, four days later, you know what happened. The ship hit an iceberg. And while uh, Reverend Harper was actually having his evening devotional time, and uh, the call was, get to the lifeboats. So he took his six-year-old daughter, wrapped her in a blanket, uh, and took her to the lifeboats, and placed her in the lifeboats, kissed her on the head, uh, put his wife's niece on the lifeboat as well. He was pretty sure he would never see them again. And then he went up and down the decks for a while, trying to convince Christians to give up their seat on the lifeboats so that people who don't know Christ yet would have a chance to find him before they went to eternity. And then just moments before the ship finally went down, he finally jumped into that freezing North Atlantic water. And uh, passengers who were in the lifeboats reported later that he swam from person to person for a while when his strength held out, begging them to ask Christ to forgive them and, and begging them, and preaching the gospel to them in the water. What is it that causes somebody in the last moments of their life to go to other people and share with them the good news that Jesus will forgive them, that Jesus has life for them? Why would somebody do that? What, what possesses somebody to do that? Well, because Reverend Harper had a deep sense of the reality of what comes next after this life, the reality of heaven and hell. And he had enough of the love of God in him that he wanted people to experience Jesus forever, not, an, uh, not a Christless eternity. So I hope that you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, would share that urgency. Letting the reality of hell sink in is not a very comfortable thing. But when it does, it can really provoke us to join Jesus' mission. Francis Chan said, when you talk about hell, it's not about doctrine, it's about destinies. The destiny of people. I mean, if we can talk about hell without any pain or discomfort, we haven't grasped it yet. If there's no urgency in our lives, uh, to help people find Jesus, then we have not grasped what Jesus is trying to tell us. We can't let this kind of conversation be an intellectual exercise where we say, okay, got that Bible knowledge here, I'll tuck that away now, got that doctrine. Now we need to let Jesus' words about hell sober us and to make us uncomfortable enough that we take action. Let it change the way that we see other people, the way we live, the way we talk. Uh, when I was in seminary, I worked as a projectionist at a movie theater. It's about six theaters, the middle two. Um, I had projectors in the lobby up on platforms. And so when I was going to thread the, the next film and such in the projector, th in those theaters, I would uh, be on the platform. And I remember one night I was looking down at the people, buying their popcorn, getting their tickets and such. And I remember thinking, I remember it hitting me. All those people there are going in one of two directions. Some of the people in that lobby know Jesus Christ personally and they're, they're, they've been made alive in him and they're, they're going to spend eternity with him. And other people in that lobby don't know Christ and they're headed to a Christless eternity, which is hell. Those are the only two options. Everybody in that lobby qualifies for one of those two destinations right now. And the Lord used that moment in the lobby to help form in me this, this uh, determination that I was going to 
do everything I could to point people to Jesus, to help people who don't know him come to know him. And uh, that's what I've been trying to do for 40 years um, because Jesus said the stakes are really high. So when we look at this passage and we read this story about the rich man and, and Lazarus, um, the question is, how often have I been troubled for the lost on their behalf? Because it really is disturbing to think about hell. It's easy to put it aside. But time is limited. Have you had a time where you've just been uncomfortable thinking about this person that you care about is maybe headed to hell? And none of us like to be there. I don't like to be there. I, I remember... Um, a couple few years ago, my father being in intensive care on a respirator, and I had visited him that day, and I went home that night, and as I was laying in bed that night, I thought, he could die within hours. It's very possible. And I knew that he had not said yes to Christ, because I'd been, that day, I'd talked with him about Jesus. And for 40 years plus, I'd talk with him about Jesus, and he'd always said no, and I knew that. And it made me almost physically ill as I laid in bed. I could not sleep that night. I just asked God, give me one more chance. And uh, that next morning, uh, I had not got a call from the hospital, so I made a beeline there and went to his room, and, and God gave me one more chance. And there was nobody in his room, oddly enough. That normally didn't happen, and I was able to communicate uh, with him again about the gospel and uh, he responded without words but he, he squeezed my hand I was asked and I said the Lord if you want him if you want the Lord in your life you can you can just tell me and tell him by just squeezing my hand and and after a few seconds he did and he lived another year or so um, and I don't know fully what happened in his life but he started going to church at his, his home I don't know you know that was not normal for him and so something happened, and I had a peace when, when he did pass away that somehow it was okay with, with him and God. Have you had a time, have you had a time where you've just felt the discomfort of somebody you know is not, that you know they're saying no to Christ now, and that that just, that reality sinks in? When we started Crossroads over 30 years ago, we started with this as our driving factor. We were gonna connect with people who don't know Christ, and we were gonna make each worship service an opportunity for people to see Jesus. Each of our small group gatherings, we're gonna teach people to, you know, to pray for people that don't know Christ yet, pray for the empty chair in your group. Some will say, oh, it's about numbers, and, and I, would, I know that that's not true in the sense they mean it. I mean, no, I know we love and care about people, but in a sense, it is about numbers because the reality is we are trying to reduce the number of people who would go to hell from this region. We are shooting to lower that number. And I think by God's grace, over these last few decades, that's been the case. But the reality is the larger a church grows and the older it is, um, the less outward focused it naturally becomes the, because there's more time and attention and resources that are given to members. And the gravitational pull, it's just invariable. It's not just, you know, for churches around here for us. No, it's just, just invariable. It's the way this works. There's this natural gravitational pull to focus inward for a church unless, unless the leaders counteract that. Uh, they, and by reminding uh, the church of the, of the mission of Jesus, about being intentional, about reaching out. And I'm grateful that Pastor Christie and the team that's going to be leading on into the future of Crossroads that they have that passion and they have that focus and that we together are going to be able to keep pointing people to Jesus so that they will experience the goodness of his, of his love here and eternally. Um, Jesus didn't tell us about hell to threaten us, but to warn us so that we would never say, why didn't you tell me about this? Friends, we cannot get this wrong. There's no do-over. Hebrews 9, 27. People are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. If today you don't know you're standing with Jesus, if today you've been kind of living apart from him, today's a really good day to say, well, all right, Lord, I want to offer my life to you. You lead me 
and I need your forgiveness. And you know what? He will do that. He will receive you. The scripture says he will receive you. You, you don't have to earn your way to heaven. And the truth is, you know, going to church won't make you sure that you're going to go to heaven. You know, trying to be a good person, giving a certain amount of money, that's not going to do it. But saying yes to Jesus, and then he'll change your life. He will transform you, and you'll experience his love and presence. You'll never live a day apart from him, starting right now and then forever into eternity as you yield your life to him. The scripture says in Romans 10, 9, that if we will confess with our mouth, like if we will say, Jesus is Lord, we will admit that he is the one's in charge of our life. Like we're willing to follow him. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's the promise. And you can say yes to that promise today. So let's bow right now in prayer. And if today you want to make your life one that reflects Jesus, one that you live in his presence now and always, if you've not done so, you can just say to him, in the quietness of your own heart, just talk to the Lord, and you can repeat a prayer after me saying, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. Please forgive me. I believe you've risen from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to follow you. Lord, I pray for each person praying that prayer right now that, Lord, you would be working a miraculous thing in their life, that you would be bringing them from death to life. Lord, we know that's what you do according to your scripture. So I pray you would seal their decision in Jesus' name. I pray by your spirit, you would surround and lead them, Lord. Help them to know how to follow you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, uh, that as they do so, that they would know the experience of living with your love, living with your peace, with your joy, that will start and never end. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.